So welcome back, as promised, and as Edie was touching on there, a fascinating conversation um, about some of the challenges ahead. And let's talk about the role of technology in all of that. We touched on it in our first panel about the adoption of technology in healthcare and how it could make a difference should this happen again. If we are dealing with a global pandemic, what technology and collaboration can do to help healthcare systems around the world cope. So let's delve straight into our next panel. It is a packed panel, so let me introduce you to the guests who are joining us. We have Shashank ND, who is founder and chief executive at Practo. That's uh, launched products that aim at either connecting patients to doctors or vice versa and helping medical professionals manage their clients and patients. Uh, Devang Mehta, who is from Ant Hill, is responsible for various activities in the fund's operations, uh, including structuring marketing strategy investments. Uh, Noel Gordon is with us, who chairs the NHS Digital Board. Hajinder Kang, who is Director of Healthcare Life Sciences Bioeconomy at the Department for International Trade at Healthcare UK. And here in the studio, I'm delighted to say, is Roshan Shetty, um, who is from Infosys, over two decades of experience in the IT services industry. So a very warm welcome to you all. Roshan, since you're with me here, let's start with you, because we were touching on this a little earlier in the panel uh, about some of the challenges that have been posed by this pandemic. And technology, one of the solutions, it would give us access to a lot more information and a lot more data. I wonder, first of all, if you paint a picture of where we were before this pandemic as far as technology was concerned and why greater adoption, greater use of technology could have helped us deal with this in a very different way. It's, it's a great actually backdrop to start the discussion. Uh, it, it's no secret that the healthcare industry was uh, a laggard in terms of uh, the adoption of technology mm. as compared to any other industry. And the, uh, the reasons of actually that were primarily because of uh, data security, mm -hmm. uh, personal data being actually kind of exposed. But uh, the pandemic has actually kind of caused uh, leaps and bound to kind of change that barrier, uh, primarily because uh, it was a necessity in terms of actually sharing information. So if you look at uh, the digital uh, adoptions that actually happen in terms of the contact trace, for example, or uh, the patient education, or the clinical uh, staff actually doing the uh, telehealth kind of a diagnosis, I think it became very, very uh, important uh, to kind of serve the patients through the digital means. So the barrier of actually kind of getting across some of the nuances of uh, data security uh, and uh, the adoption curve kind of took a very uh, different kind of a turn mm. during the pandemic. Now, if you look at actually the advancements that have actually happened, there have been actually advancements in terms of uh, maybe actually looking at how the vital organs actually kind of are monitored from health devices and all. But I think uh, it will still take some time for uh, the industry to kind of look at the critical vital organs that can actually be monitored through the digital interventions. Hmm. Until that time, the adoption curve will keep on increasing but will not reach a level where you can actually kind of say that the digital interventions have actually kind of made a leap and bound right. kind of an advancement in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. um, we'll pick up on some of those thoughts in a moment. Shashank Andy, let me bring you in at this point because you know it's interesting. We've seen this push now for technology and I was posing this question in the previous panel of why it has maybe taken so long for us to embrace technology in healthcare, whereas in other industries it's much more prevalent. Um, I imagine that is something that you spend your days convincing countries, companies around the world that we need greater adoption of technology in healthcare. Absolutely, Ben. Um, it, I think uh, before the advancement of the internet, um, uh, the real question that providers were asking us were that if I do adopt technology, what's the benefit that I'm going to get as a provider or the patient is going to get. Um, and and, and in, in a country like India, where the, the number of doctors are very less, doctors would like to optimize all the time that they have with patients. Um, and, and, that's the, and there were no other incentives for the doctors to really use uh, technology. Uh, we've also seen in India that 60% of, 65% uh, of spends are all out of pocket. So there's very less insurance coverage. So there are no insurance companies or uh, uh, government pushing the, uh, the provider um, to adopt technology. And in this kind of environment, the value addition that technology provided to the consumer or the doctor was very less. But fast forward to when internet came along, 
uh, more use cases were uh, you know presented themselves uh, like decision support systems as well as uh, ai algorithms which could help doctors uh, diagnose patients better but with the pandemic and the lockdown coming in uh, it has certainly accelerated the adoption of technology all uh, all the way through just to give you one stat ben um, before uh, the pandemic hit india was was seeing roughly around 5 million or 10 million teleconsultations uh, a year uh, today we are seeing between 50 million to 100 million uh, teleconsultations a year and i think uh, we are accelerating so fast that i i think in a few years we're going to see billions of teleconsultations as just one aspect of digital health uh, adoption a year um so i think this is this acceleration is uh, increasing as more and more use cases are being created uh, for um for for the adoption of technology and which which provides value for both the consumer and providers and i think this is going to uh, accelerate even faster as we go along yeah uh, deva meta uh, from an investment point of view where is the biggest growth coming and where are the most exciting opportunities in this field yeah for sure uh, you know covid has acted like a let's say a pearl harbor moment for the healthcare industry where uh, extreme duress and uh, has created a lot of innovation in in telemedicine uh, remote care uh, immunity building in areas like that so in recent times uh, those have have definitely been uh, the key areas of investment and scaling activities at antel as well as across the investing health healthcare globally investing system but uh, you know traditional diseases have not gone away you know cancer diabetes asthma they all remain prevalent they all have to be cured i have to say be cured in a traditional way but they have to be preempted um, they have to be done through precision medicine the segment of one where you know just treating someone with cancer through a chemo uh, and hoping and praying is not uh, acceptable anymore so I think uh, what COVID has accelerated also is the need for personalized medication, precision medicine, holistic immunity that uh, encompasses not just um, you know keeping fit, but keeping fit through a, a holistic system of traditional Indian medication as well as a westernized system. So all these areas have translated into a lot of innovation from the early stage ecosystem, and we continue to see a lot of exciting plans um, moving forward. Um, Noel Gordon, uh, from an NHS point of view here in the UK, um, digital adoption has suddenly come on. It seems leaps and bounds in the last eighteen months, and I know a lot of work is going on behind the scenes. But I wonder what the the sort of hurdles you've had to overcome in the last eighteen months in terms of adoption, but also the rollout of digital technology. Yes, uh, thanks, Ben, for having me on the panel, and, and just to set the record straight, I'm a former chair of NHS Digital. Um, I think the central question that most governments and health systems are wrestling with right now is how do we design a health system to live with COVID, to live with pandemics for the next three or four years? You know, one of the questions that's exercising governments around the world is what should be, what could be a target rate of impact, rather like in monetary policy, living with a target inflation rate. How do we live with a targeted inflation rate, and what is the impact on the design part of our systems? And I think it's pretty clear in the UK that we're going to live with the health infrastructure of COVID, the utility of that infrastructure, test and trace, vaccinations, digital vaccine records, developing the NHS app. More of a personal healthcare record, or indeed a prevention observatory, than we have known in the past. All those elements we're going to live with the utility of a pandemic infrastructure for some time to come. Both those assumptions have a big impact on the NHS and our healthcare system. One is how do we treat patients better in the home? And this is where um, digital therapeutics, remote monitoring, sensors, a number of technology tools which have been embryonic pre-COVID suddenly place as a new factor of production alongside workforce, um, our hospitals, and funding as a way of releasing some capacity to cope with what is 
permanently in level of new demand. I think secondly, it will allow us to completely rethink how we serve both patients, uh, outpatients uh, with non-communicable diseases are a huge weight on the health system in all countries. And we can no longer offer and serve outpatients exclusively in our major hospitals. It, they just don't have the capacity and it doesn't make sense. And it's not best for the patient in many cases because the pathway is far too complex. And thirdly, we had to design our own acute hospitals to live with COVID and long COVID, and particularly use this pandemic to release capacity that sh really shouldn't have been there in the first place. And something like 80% of presentations at A&E and in our hospitals don't need to be treated in the hospital. And so that stratification or distratification and triage of where we send sick patients to the best point of care, as opposed to everything has to be done in the acute hospital, I think it's a massive opportunity for us to use technology and digital to serve people differently. So, net net, uh, the COVID pandemic has taken us to a completely different place where delivering medical outcomes actually won't be that radical in the next few years. They will become mainstream. And I particularly think that something in virtual clinics, virtual hospitals at home, is the major breakthroughs in designing our healthcare system as a result of this pandemic. No, for now, thank you. I'm going to come back to you in just a second, and maybe I'm hoping you might be able to speak a little louder for us, because I know it's quite difficult for some to hear, but um, we'll come back to you in a second. Let me bring in Harjinder Kang here. Um, Harjinder, as we heard there from No, I mean, the, we see the benefits um, of that adoption of technology. Uh, it is clear to see how it could change our response to something like a global health pandemic, and yet there is a trust deficit still. And I wonder what you make of how you change that perception of handing over personal medical information uh, and how you convince people that it will be used for the right reasons and not other reasons. Mm, that's a very, very interesting question. And, and, and thanks for having me on the, on the panel, Ben, and uh, delighted to be here. It's been the old, the age old question of who does the data belong to and what do you do with it? Um, it's one that's been grappled with by policymakers across the world for, for, for decades. And certainly in my time in the pharmaceutical industry, it was something that, you know, people were not um, willing to share openly to say that my personal healthcare data is one that could be misused, if not um, handled correctly and so forth. My personal view is that um, over the pandemic period, this, this, certainly the healthcare sector and, the, and maybe the pharmaceutical industry, the perception in, in the public has changed and dramatically changed in that it's gone from being a, an unknown and misunderstood industry to one that's potentially become like the saviour of the world at this point in time in terms of the way that the vaccines have been discovered, developed, rolled out across the world, and the impact that they're having on bringing some degree of uh, normalization. I think the other thing that's sort of happened as well is that there was an evolution going on with respect to technology adoption and, and the utilization of data within that technology. Um, that has just gone completely um, beyond the trajectory that it was on. So that, you know, it's now becoming quite normalized that you are openly discussing your health record, your health situation across the, the, um, the internet, across various uh, media um, capabilities. And certainly my, um, my two daughters are in the NHS and the front line in uh, both doctors. And, and effectively, they haven't seen patients face to face for, for quite a while and effectively are seeing patients remotely, as, as Noel mentioned earlier, in terms of virtual clinics and uh, virtual diagnoses. I think we, this is here to stay now. I think we are changing 
the mindset of patients to say that you don't need to be in a shiny brand new hospital or a brand new mm. clinic in order to get um, healthcare provision. And how do you those, know? Sorry to interrupt. I mean, is it just a case of pure generational issues that younger people are much more willing to adopt technology and therefore are much more likely to trust it and what it is used for? And it is maybe older patients who are still struggling to, to come to terms with it. Or does this more fundamental a trust issue regardless of your background? Um, I would have said it was a generation issue before the pandemic. I would say now it's actually becoming normalised. It doesn't matter what age group you are. Um, I think there's always going to be the, you know, the younger groups are more savvy with the technology and are able to use um, all the different media uh, much more adequately than the older uh, older generations. But even that's not uh, true anymore. I mean, even my parents, uh, we've been voice, you know, Skyping uh, during the pandemic to keep in touch. So people have now started to use technology as a communication medium on a much more regular basis and are much more comfortable with it. I think the trust element is, is, is uh, one that still is needing a lot of policy work, a lot of understanding in terms of how far do you go with this data, because it's actually critical to the future development of the new technologies that have just been discussed, whether it's genomics and personalized medicine, whether it's the way that you actually are preventing disease rather than curing disease, because you know what people face in terms of risk going forward in terms of their genetic makeup. All of these things are miraculous things to come in terms of medical developments over the next you know, a few decades, but it will require um, individuals to be very assured as to what happens with their personalized healthcare data and what it's used for and what it's not used for. And that's all uh, in the gift of the policymakers and that is probably the big discussions going on right now. Yeah, um, Roshan, let me bring you in a, as well here. I mean, you paint a picture, if you will, of what technology might allow us to do that we're not currently able to do, and, and I guess how that will then better prepare us to deal with another pandemic. So maybe I think, uh, let me start with an analogy. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I was actually kind of uh, uh, seeing the Star Wars series. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if you remember, I mean, pretty much everything that you actually saw in the Star Wars series is, is a reality today, apart from two things that I can remember. One is the transporter, which is to transport person from a, location A to B. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the tricorder, which was a medical device that the doctor used to actually kind of take it across the body and, and examine the vital organs and then prescribe there itself what, what needs to be done. So if you look at uh, technology right now, technology has actually reached a level where telemedicine uh, contact tracing, all these things are actually kind of uh, uh, virtually now the way of uh, the new normal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even if you look at the hospital sector, the provider sectors, they've actually kind of adopted, I think about 44% of actually uh, the providers have actually invested in actually technology related kind of initiatives. Uh, I think what would be the next step where uh, technology would actually kind of play a big part is the whole cloud adoption because yeah. uh, data needs to be actually available across the cloud. And the pandemic has actually shown us that uh, the, the vaccine, which was created in less than a year's time, was because of actually the sharing of information that actually happened across the medical industry. So I think that is a leap bound that I actually see will happen. That is the adoption of cloud. And data actually again shows that there's going to be uh, a CAGR growth of about 11.8%. Uh, on the adoption of cloud by 2026. So right. that's going to be a huge kind of a We're shift. not talking about a very long time. Though. It's not, yeah. it's just a few years. Yeah. And the second part is actually going to be the entire uh, human-centric design of actually digital uh, equipments because, uh, again, a survey actually shows that about 84% of uh, the, the patients are actually fine uh, receiving uh, the advice virtually now, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they are actually also fine using the wearables. Uh, in order to kind of have some of their uh, health related kind of diagnostics done. Uh, and, and virtually everyone is actually ready to share their data. So your earlier question in terms of the distrust, in terms of sharing of information, I think that's behind us now with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the entire adoption of human centric kind of a design yep. of actually equipments is going to be important because the end goal will be that uh, once you actually have these uh, diagnoses actually done, 
can you also treat and operate uh, patients virtually? So that's going to be the next leap. So if I have to kind of uh, uh, sum it up, it's going to be the cloud adoption. It's actually going to be the, uh, the adoption of human centric kind of uh, uh, equipments. And, and the third is actually kind of the continuation of actually sharing of the information yeah. that has actually started in the pandemic. Um, I want to come on in the time that we have left in just a moment to talk about some of the infrastructure issues and some of the, uh, the possible hurdles that may get in the way of this adoption, because we're laying out a stage here of, of quite how amazing it could be. But of course, reality is often very different, isn't it? Uh, but let me jump into a question from Priyanka, who is in um, Delhi, um, because I'm aware that I want to get a range of voices on this. So do get involved in this conversation. You can use the hashtag, uh, uh, join us on Twitter, I should say, at IGF Updates. Uh, please send your questions and thoughts in that way. Uh, but let's take a, a listen to a question from Priyanka. Namaste and hello, everyone. My name is Priyanka Deo, and I'm a journalist based in New Delhi, India. Thanks for making me a part of India Global Forum 2021. My question is that wave two of the coronavirus pandemic has hit all of us really hard in India. With me being nine months pregnant now, I was especially scared since I was not eligible to take the coronavirus vaccine in India. What are the major factors we need to primarily look at in terms of health infrastructure to avoid mass panic and disorder in society? So Shashank, hopefully um, you could hear that. Let me put that question to you. We're talking about infrastructure, aren't we here? Um, what are the things that are possibly holding this adoption back and, and where do you see the investment needs to be to make this a reality? Possibly two areas uh, to look at. Uh, the first one is for the first time in a country like India, which is a pretty, you know, pretty wide and large. For the first time, every Indian today has access to a doctor, a quality doctor, and there is medicine and uh, diagnostic availability at every pin code in India today. So this is possible largely because of internet and the mobile uh, phone penetration. But that's still at around 60%. Um, I think uh, the ability for us to move that up to 100% and make sure every PIN code has access to internet uh, would, is, the, is the fastest way to ensure that every PIN code um, or every geography in India has access to a doctor, um, uh, access to doctor medicines or diagnostics. The second very important aspect is the interoperability between different stakeholders. That you have in healthcare, there are providers. There are, there are pharmaceutical industries, there are the, the pharmacies, there are diagnostic centers. Uh, how do you make sure that all of them talk together? And I'm very happy that you know India, um, as it has led in the, as an example, will put out the NDHM or the UHI, which is stands for the Universal Health Interface. This will allow information and services to talk to each other and build on each other. And with this kind of infrastructure. Um, you know, you can actually make sure that all the different digital services and all the different stakeholders can actually talk together in a unison manner. The standards are the same across different providers, so the data exchange is uh, possible. And, and on the fly, very innovative solutions can be built out because the base infrastructure has been put, uh, put in place through this, uh, you know, UHI technology framework that the government uh -huh. of India has recently released. And on top of that, you know, very innovative solutions can be built out. This will ensure that um, you know, when, when the next pandemic hit, be, it would be access to medicines, it could be access to information, it could be access to doctors, it could be access to labs, it could be any of these things. People will not panic and run out uh, outdoor or get onto social media and ask, but there will be actual technology which can be you know, uh, uh, put to use to solving for this uh, kind of panic. So I'm very happy that these two aspects of uh, the, the leveraging the access to internet and the second one is uh, a, a standard protocol system like the UHI that India has put together. I think these are the two things that would uh, really be the right infrastructure for uh, uh, to, to for digital health to prosper. Um, wonderful. I want to get around each of you, and we only have a brief amount of time left. So if I can ask you to keep these following answers pretty brief. But Noel Gordon, let me bring you back in at this point about how optimistic you are that the work that has been done so far and the leaps and bounds that have been made in, in, in terms of digital adoption so far this year that that momentum can carry on. Yes, thanks, Ben. And hopefully you can hear me better this We can. Time. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I am optimistic. And I think particularly we have to deal with technology in two spheres. There is the infrastructure of COVID, 
which I mentioned before, but there's also the infrastructure of technology needed to deal with the backlog of patients that we have, 5 million in this country today, who are still waiting for elective and non-elective care. And, you know, they've been squeezed out of the system. So I'd like to think, be optimistic in two respects. One, um, we're putting, we should put more resources into prevention. We lost an opportunity over the last five years by not putting enough resources into prevention. Most of what we did went to treat for very good reasons. But it, prevention never really hit the agenda. Now, I think there's a huge realization amongst policymakers that we have to use technology differently for the prevention side of it. And secondly, there are some fundamental changes to the way hospitals operate that are going to stay, I think, for the foreseeable yeah. future. Yeah. I mean, digital front doors, AI, ways of looking at triaging patients and stratification of risk, post to follow up by decentralizing care through technology. It, these are all fundamental changes to the flow of patients with the system that will actually result in a lot better outcomes as well. Uh -huh. And Hodjinda, you know, what are you most um, excited about as far as what technology can deliver that you know, will allow us to do things in different ways? What is the thing that's on your radar right now? I think the biggest thing is access. I think it will give a lot more um, healthcare around the world to uh, people who didn't have access to it before. Uh, it's a great shrinker of geography technology. That's the, the first point I'd make in terms of people who can connect with healthcare providers many hundreds of miles away to get uh, basic healthcare, let alone mm -hmm. anything specialised. So I think that's the big one for me, that actually a lot more of the planet will get uh, basic healthcare because of technology. Mm. Um, and Devon, for, again, from an, from an investment point of view, um, I wonder what those conversations you are, you're having now with clients about how important investment in healthcare can be and those potential returns, given that they are riding a wave that has already, has already been created by this pandemic. Yeah, I think uh, to your point, uh, technology will continue to have a, a significant multiplier effect on investment money. Uh, one of our portfolio companies, Chronicare, uh, as an example, reduces the time it takes a skilled nurse to measure a wound and upload it into the EMR by a staggering 95%, you know, from 30 minutes down to two. It's a perfect example of, of how a technology moving at warp speed can dramatically upend the entire economics across the continuum of the healthcare uh, ecosystem and bring about hitherto unimagined efficiencies across the spectrum. Um, it's been wonderful to get your thoughts on all of this. Um, we are packing so much into the agenda today, so our time is tight, but um, I'm really grateful for you spending some time with us here at India Global Forum. Uh, to Shashank ND, to Devang Mehta, to Noel Gordon, to Hajinder Kang, and to Roshan Shetty, who is with me in the studio. My thanks uh, for your insights into that panel. Um, now, given that we're talking about healthcare, it sort of seems appropriate that before we get our very special address, that is coming up a little later in the programme, uh, that we stop, we pause, and we enjoy some armchair yoga. Take a look. 